cashes in, and Hawaiian Oregon put gay marriage and state ballot measures on the front burner. All up next on In the Life, America's information line on gay and lesbian issues and culture. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Fred P. Hochberg and Tom Healy, James C. Hormel, Jonathan B. Sheffer, Jeffrey B. Soroff, Eldon W. Tamblin, and In the Life's National Membership Network. In the... Welcome to the fourth season premiere of In the Life. I'm Katherine Linton. On this program, we'll review the world of drag and the film Tu Wong Fu in a way that USA Today and Entertainment Tonight never could. Patrick Swayze. Hello, Mary. You've played a dancer, a ghost, now a homosexual drag queen. Why this role now? Then we look at the work of creative lesbian and gay artists in the world of music and film including clips from a powerful documentary called Ballot Measure 9 about how the gay movement nearly suffered a serious setback in Oregon. But we begin this edition of In the Life with a visit to China, host of the United Nations Fourth World Conference on Women. Hillary Clinton may have gotten most of the headlines, but an hour outside of Beijing, thousands of women were organizing to fight for empowerment and equality, among them lesbians from countries big and small, meeting to network and mobilize against homophobia worldwide. From the Great Wall in China, correspondent Jocelyn Taylor reports. Here at the Great Wall in China, not far from Beijing, people are talking about women's rights to health, to equality, to freedom from violence, and lesbian rights. That's because nearby, the Fourth World Conference on Women is taking place. This meeting, and it's really two meetings as you'll see, will set the agenda for women's issues for the next decade. Lesbian organizing for the Beijing Conference began at the last World Conference on Women in Kenya in 1985. Memorably, the main lesbian event was daily meetings outdoors. The Nairobi Conference, we were really pleased to have four workshops uh, about the lesbian issue, and we took our space on the, on the lawn. And we were happy that one Dutch minister mentioned the word lesbian and talked about the situation of lesbians at the official conference. Ten years later, we have a lesbian tent, there are non-stop activities going on. Lesbians are being invited into all sorts of uh, forums and workshops. And at the official level, um, sexual rights and lesbian rights have become a, uh, quite an important political item. This discussion that takes place with members of the official delegation is important because sometimes they do become more open-minded. As predicted, the final consensus at the official United Nations meetings did not include the controversial phrase sexual orientation. However, some 30 governments expressed their unequivocal support for sexual rights. In our own policies already since a long time, we believe that there shouldn't be any discrimination uh, on, on, uh, sexual, on the basis of sexual preference uh, and that there should be uh, possibilities for everybody to express also sexual preference in the way that the individuals choose. Sixty kilometers outside of Beijing, here in Wairo, the NGO, or Non-Governmental Organization Conference, is the heart and soul of this international event. 
women have gathered from grassroots organizations all over the world to caucus on women's issues. And the existence of the lesbian tents ensured high visibility and some shelter from the constant rain. One of the most common accusations of, about lesbian rights and lesbian issues is that it's not a concern of people from Asia, from Africa, or from Latin America. It's, it's something that the Australians, the North Americans, and the Europeans like very much because they're rich. But seeing the diversity of the people uh, attending the, the workshops, coming together at the lesbian tent every day, it's very encouraging. I was really curious, you know, about this lesbianism. In India, we don't, we have, uh, I mean, we don't know. We don't know much about lesbianism. Here I learned, I learned that it's something natural, no? Lesbianism is some, it's a natural, it's a way of life and something natural uh, with some people. The principle that lesbian rights are human rights became a demand as well as a rallying cry. Lesbians made their case when over 400 women staged a dramatic march at the NGO Forum site. And when Daphne Shalinsky, incarcerated in mental institutions because she was gay, testified on the major tribunal on women's human rights around the world. So in 1981, at the age of 14, I was labeled mentally ill and confined to the psychiatric ward of Michael Reese Hospital in Chicago, Illinois. I was later transferred to Forest Hospital in Des Plaines, Illinois, and then to the Constance Boltman Wilson Center in Faribault, Minnesota, losing four entire years of my youth. Stretches of solitary confinement, heavy medication, physical restraint, and horror stories from staff became routine. There's nothing that's guaranteed here for the people who live here, and certainly not for the lesbians who live in China. Um, when I was here in 1972, the Cultural Revolution was still in effect, Chairman Mao was still alive. Anybody who deviated in any way from the going political line was in danger of, of being killed. Today, there's actually Chinese lesbians who come forward who have to be secret in their day-to-day -day life here in China, but they'll come to a conference like this and reveal themselves to be lesbians. There's a need to articulate the concerns of lesbians organizing in the South, in the third world country, in a place where economic and social situation is still very difficult for anybody and then particularly more difficult for lesbians. I'm trying to establish some kind of Eastern European lesbian networking because uh, um, this is, this is the, the best opportunity for me to do that because there are not so many uh, international conferences like this where everybody is here, when everybody is here. But again, I'm, uh, you know, we're facing a, a low visibility of lesbians in uh, Eastern European women's um, organizations. Beijing, if nothing else, will have ensured that lesbian networking and, and lesbian strength has, is a reality all over the world. At the Great Wall, this is Jocelyn Taylor for In the Life. As lesbian participation at the World Conference on Women shows, gay activism has gone global. Amazing when you realize it was just 40 years ago that lesbians and gay men began to network and organize here in the United States. Some trace the birth of that movement to Los Angeles, home in the 1950s to such pioneering gay groups as the Mattachine Society, America's first social and political organization for gay men, and the Daughters of Belitis, a women's group whose primary goal was education on the subject of lesbianism. In 1995, LA's gay community carries a lot of political and economic clout. But in a town most often associated with Hollywood, it's the movie studios that may have the greatest effect on how the rest of the country views lesbians and gay men. How ironic, then, that one of the latest big-budget, big-star movies to come out of Tinseltown is about drag queens. And how appropriate that we have invited to help us explain this phenomenon the legendary film star Mary Dale as our special guest correspondent. 
Thank you, Catherine. It's true. Universal and Amblin have spent millions on a recently released film about three drag queens on the road to Hollywood. It's called To Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Newmar. Quite a title. But unlike such films as Some Like It Hot or the more recent Mrs. Doubtfire, this film is not about straight men putting on hoes to escape trouble. No. These drag queens are gay, gay, gay. One can only wonder if America is ready to accept that the divine inspiration for drag is firmly rooted in the gay community. I think people are starting to, to realize that we have many things inside of us, and it's okay. Every one of them is okay. Being gay, I was thrilled that Amblin was going to make a drag queen movie and certainly felt, you know, it was sort of my calling as a staff producer at Amblin to be on this one once it had come along. It's a movie about uh, acceptance and uh, self-realization and friendship. I think it's about time with all the wonderful drag things that have been out in the community to take a mainstream story and splash it across America. I was trying to be like a, a, a Latin, Sharon Stone-ish, mm. wild, Gina Lola Brigida type. You're second class, but it'll be second rate your whole life. We had like angel drag queens who, who were signed to us. Mine was Loritza uh -huh. Dumont. And, and I hung out with her and she was like, you know, teach me the flavor. <laughs> how do I look? And then he just showed me how to walk, how to dance in heels, how to, how to swish, how to talk, how to be seductive, the whole bit. When we first walked out on stage at Webster Hall with hundreds of real drag queens that are very good at it, and uh, it was very, very intimidating. By the end of the week, when people saw that we were really taking this seriously and, and trying to put 100% of our hearts and souls into it, by the end of the week, drag queens were on their feet screaming for us, and that was the biggest and best validation I think we could have gotten. She's a diva. She's a diva of the divas. She's a smart diva. She's a cultural diva. I know what you need. I hardly think you're the man to give it to me. She's a spiritual diva. This is in the middle of my transformation. <laughs> Why do you think such macho stars uh, were so eager to play these roles? Oh, I think there's a feminine side of absolutely everybody. And in a way, if you've been, if you've been ex expressing your macho side, that leads a lot of femme to come out. Yes, it's the yin and yang <laughs> of life. I see Hollywood changing in general in that um, certainly behind the camera, everyone is just more willing uh, to be open and to be who they really are, whoever that is. If I don't sleep in a real bed, I'm going to start to freak, OK? People are going to be cruel to us. It could get violent. Vita, you know we have been there before. Well, was it difficult for you to, to identify with someone who's such an outcast in society? No, yeah, I mean, from that point of view, I knew I knew it fairly well. You know, being raised uh, with a choreographer and a ballet teacher as a mother, and and doing ballet all my life in Redneck, Texas. You know, that went over like a fart in a spacesuit. So, <laughs> so it wasn't uh, too difficult to identify at all on that level in yeah. terms of feeling outcast and feeling different. Well, I think for me, the whole the, the one of the most prevalent themes in the whole movie is to live life from day to day as if. You're not promised tomorrow. You know, today is an important day, and you're being blessed with it, so why not take full advantage of all of its splendor and all of its beauty and all of its uh, glamour? We've assembled five remarkable drag artists for tea to hear their thoughts on this new mainstreaming of drag. Your tea, Miss Dear. <laughs> Thank you, Daisy. You're welcome. Charming. It's very fitting, actually, that we've gathered them here at the famous Lucky Chang's restaurant in the heart of Manhattan's East Village. This vibrant neighborhood has long been home to numerous clubs where legions of drag divas have plied their craft. Wigstock, that colorful festival, was born here. And RuPaul, now a household name, strutted her stuff here long before she became a cover girl. Red girl. In attendance at our tea party was Everett Quinton, artistic director and grand dame of the ridiculous theatrical company. Iris Sif, artistic director and diva of La Grande Chena Opera. John Epperson, who's taken the art of lip syncing to a new level as lip syncer. Every single one is real. 
Jeff Robeson, who goes by the moniker Barla Jean Merman. I am a woman, hear me roar. And Charles Bush, the author and star of Vampire Lesbians of Sodom and a slew of other plays. He's my favorite. Don't fence me in. If we're very quiet, we can listen in on their conversation. Well, the same way that Patrick Swayze was playing this role as this Vita Boam, for most of us, it's the way we are. I mean, we play a character. We are not this character 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, we, you know, the same thing that they were doing. You know, they were a straight man playing, a, you know, this drag queen, and we're, you know, a gay men playing, you know, mm -hmm. some unbelievable, you know, female characters. You must excuse me for being so rude. But don't you find also, though, in sort of the um, popularization of, of drag in the media, though it, it is generally it becomes desexualized. I mean, uh, like Mrs. Doubtfire, which was mm -hmm. I, I found kind of appalling in a certain yeah, sense. Except for RuPaul, RuPaul presents himself He's as sexy. a sexy showgirl. Yes, and people are accepting that, and mm -hmm. that's a breakthrough. Yeah, yes. yeah, because I mean, he really is genuinely beautiful. But they're not mm -hmm. going to let us be queers. See, they want to if they desex it. It makes it safe. I don't, mm -hmm. we, I don't, we don't do safe theater. People say I'm misogynist. That's hardly safe. Well, I would be curious to ask you, though, about this. It's such an easy attack on, on drag to call it misogynist. And, and yet I, I think that with, I can't imagine too many performers who that, that is their intention to ridicule women. I, th I think that, if anything, drag is, is more rebellion against the constraints of, of masculinity. I mean, each sex has their own um, kind of prison, and, and with, for men, there's such a traditionally a limit, limitation to gesture or flamboyance or, or emotion or color that I think that when people get in drag, they uh, rather than wanting to to play, you know, be sort of a librarian, they want to be the most outrageous woman possible. Why should I be afraid of one dead gigolo? because we may do similar, you know, we have part of a genre on stage, right. we're different people, which is okay. I mean, I have to, some of my biggest problems are running an opera company as an artistic director financially and uh, saving my soprano voice, you know, while I'm pushing 50, like any genetically correct <laughs> soprano. I, I mean, I have to have a high C or I can't work. The drag is the dressing on what I do. <laughs> Well, you know, drag is liberating. And yeah. When I put on my drag, I can be this over-the-top person. But a lie. <laughs> well, I do think we serve a certain function, though, in a rather drab world. That uh, I think one of the reasons drag is is so big now is I, I think the public enjoys seeing a bigger-than-life lady, and I think that the real women are not encouraged to be bigger than life. That seemed. It's, they felt to be sort of grotesque or, I mean, people want to play Norma Desmond, but they don't want to be Norma Desmond. Right. In the world, if we adopted a live and let live policy towards everyone in the world, we'd be okay. <laughs> so boys will be boys. And it seems that sometimes it's okay for boys to be girls. This is Mary Dale for In the Life. God bless. In the fantasy world of Tu Wong Fu, being glamorous and fabulous can get you a long way in small town America. But that's Hollywood. Back in the real world, there are some places where the rights of gays and lesbians have been under attack. Here's correspondent Darius Tahaz with a look at Ballot Measure 9. The Los Angeles Times called Ballot Measure 9 a truly frightening film. It's a documentary on the attempt of the Oregon Citizens Alliance, or the OCA, to pass an anti-gay ballot initiative in that state. Producer-director Heather McDonald spent eight months covering the campaign, one that fanned the flames of hysteria and hate, a campaign that may soon be waged again in other states. I started out making the film because I felt it was very important to tell the story of what happened in Oregon because it would be very difficult to tell it in words. It was so visceral. It felt like a war zone. It felt uh, the emotions were so high. People, you know, people were having nervous breakdowns just from that kind of tension. So I knew it would make a good film. Take sodomy, for example. If somebody's going to do that, 
It is dangerous. It is going to rip and tear. It's going to cause infections. I don't care what you say. And when you don't do things like that are not designed for your body, it is abnormal, wrong, and unnatural. Heterosexual sex can be just as dirty, just as unclean, and you can catch the same diseases. What's your point? I simply want to know who's next. Is it the blacks? Is it the Native Americans? Is it Catholics? Is it Mormons? Is it Jews? Is it people who are too tall or too fat? Okay. Is, I want to know that are you going to whittle away everyone piece by piece until they're all just like you? Who is next? One of the wonderful things that they did in Oregon, um, you know, if we can say that there was anything wonderful coming out of this, is that because of the obvious discrimination in, in the measure, um, many groups realized the connections and they were able to form I think the kind of coalitions that, that we haven't seen enough of. The Archbishop, the Catholic Church uh, was very, uh, very with the No One Nine side. Uh, in fact, Catholics voted two to one against the measure, which I think as a, as a lesbian, you know, we, we think that certain people are our enemies and they don't accept us. But in this instance, I, you know, this proved not to be true. The Archbishop of the Catholic Church of of Oregon came out with a public statement uh, on why Catholics should oppose uh, ballot measure nine and Saturday night I heard a noise and then I came downstairs and the rectory was on fire and they had broken into the church and spray painted all around the church. So there was a lot of shock, tears, sadness and anger. People in this community really understand because in the 20s the Ku Klux Klan was very strong and we managed to push uh, law through to close the Catholic schools and even went through to schools and churches looking for, uh, for Catholics with guns because they thought the Catholics had an agenda to take over the state. And so I think for the people here, especially the older people, they remember the cross burnings and some of the same kinds of things. And I, I know when they saw the graffiti on the rectory, it reminded of them of the 20s. The Northwest has a lot of neo-Nazi, white supremacist, skinhead kind of element in it. And they found Ballot Measure 9 and the language and the dialogue that was happening across the state an excuse to perpetrate violence. There was a, a community of women who felt compelled to leave the state of Oregon because they were constantly harassed, had shotguns, you know, shooting over their property. Uh, two men who lived in a trailer woke up in the middle of the night with um, pellets, just, you know, shotgun fire. just against the metal side of their, of their uh, trailer. Um, that kind of thing was commonplace. I don't like trying to sleep with one eye open and one ear alert. I'm exhausted. I'm afraid. In closing, let the record of this hearing show one unavoidable conclusion. Measure 9 equals violence. By sponsoring this initiative and by waging a campaign of lies, the OCA has opened up a Pandora's box of hatred that has undermined civility, safety, and democracy. I think the power of reality and what you know what 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 real humans say in the situations when you're there on the scene and you're capturing what is actually happening to me that's very very dramatic or can be very dramatic and that's what I tried to do in Ballot Measure 9 is tell a very dramatic story. Ballot Measure 9 did not pass but it did get 43 percent of the vote. In 1994 a similar measure got 49 percent of the vote. Oregon citizens considered the issue again in 1996 as do voters in several other states a warning of more battles to come. It's one of the best known landmarks in all of Los Angeles, the Capitol Records Tower. Until recently though, if you were a band or a singer looking to get a record contract, being openly gay was the kiss of death. Melissa Etheridge, Elton John, and Katie Lang have all changed things a little. And now there's a group of musicians who hope to change it some more. Their organization is called Out Music, and their goal is to develop and promote gay singers, songwriters, and musicians. That's no excuse. <coughs> Play something gay. We want gay music written by a gay composer. There's no such thing as gay music, Buzz. Well, maybe there should be. Melinda. Well,
I think the great strength in out music has been the explosion of independent records, independently produced records that are now beginning to catch the attention of the music industry. And there are dozens of excellent, excellent recordings uh, by, by lots of talented people that are getting attention, and deservedly so. Three of the many Out Music members shared with us their art and the songs that tell their stories. Keith Christopher, Nidra Johnson, and Tom McCormick. I wrote Pieces of Lies after having seen the Names Project for the first time in 1987 on the Capitol Mall in D.C. I miss my friends I can't say how much No one can measure how deeply we touch You and I We keep hanging the key to the song is, you know, if you love someone, for Christ's sake, tell them while you have a chance. These are more than pieces of lies, more than the memories left behind. We cannot mend what's been so torn apart until. When I wrote the song, I meant to both call on the works of Audre Lorde and Pat Parker, and also just, you know, it's, it's a coming out song of sor sorts. Where will you be when they come? Are you going to stand by me when With the climate in the world today, it's like we all need to be out and showing up for each other. So it's just that where will you be when they come? They're here. Folks will find a way to hate you, no matter what you do. And you may pretty Jesus, you may be righteous through and through. I think my songs came out before I did. My songs told me that I was gay or, or informed me or helped me uh, accept that uh, before I ever consciously did. Woke up today, found out I'd been missing. Woke up today, found out I'd been gone. A sign of violence Disappeared into silence Left no trace that I had moved on This woman came up to me afterwards and she had the most strange look on her face and she said, you've been following me. And I said, what are you talking about? And she said, that song, that song is about me. I have been erased, been misplaced, I found another face, maybe The more you talk from your experience, the more likely you're, you're going to uh, trigger a response in, in someone else. Have you never been lonely for something you could not name? There 
there is a space that needs to be filled by gays and lesbians expressing their personal truth, you know, their special insights to the world. I think it's a gift to the world. Hi, I'm Wesley Snipes, and you're watching In The Life. <laughs> Still ahead on this edition of In The Life, a revealing look at several special programs which reach out to lesbians and gays who face addiction or homelessness. Also, a preview of the next big legal battleground, the right to marry. If it becomes law in Hawaii, what could that mean in your state? But first, we bring you correspondent Darius Tahaz, who shows how one hallowed institution isn't just for straight kids anymore. Do you remember your senior prom? Did you go to your senior prom? Imagine if your high school had had a prom where girls danced with girls and boys with boys. Well, that's exactly what happened at One Prom last year, sponsored by the Eagle Center, an alternative high school for gay and lesbian teens that's part of the Los Angeles Unified School District. First-time filmmaker Charlie Lang was there with his Hi8 camera to chronicle from idea to dance this amazing journey of America's first gay prom held at the Grand Ballroom of the downtown Hilton in L.A. The film is called Live to Tell. Little by little, I you know accumulated 25 hours of footage and and just began the process of trying to put it together into something. But the thing that kept me going through the difficult times was that these kids were such teachers to me. I, I was so inspired by these kids, and my fantasy at the time was if this can become any kind of a movie that's viewable by by people, I would love it to be able to instruct and inspire other people in a similar way. <laughs> There is something symbolic about being invited to your first senior prom. It's like becoming grown up almost overnight. I never went to a prom. I never went to a dance with a girl. I've never been with a girl. I never had the need to be with a girl. I've always known intrinsically that it, I was gay and I always would be gay. What are you wearing to the prom? Do you know? A uh, tuxedo with the tail. And the vest is kind of grayish with black in it. Hmm. Um, well, the shoes are just, you know, regular shoes. I'm going to wear my six inch um, Fredericks of Hollywood platforms and. Which will make you how tall? Six seven. <laughs> I'm six one without the heels. So are you looking forward to it tomorrow night? Yeah, definitely. I have my tuxedo rented and everything. Hi. So how does it feel to finally be at the prom? It's kind of strange. <laughs> <Very>. <laughs> up. I heard Raul might be there tonight at the prom. Either way, though, I'll be fine. I'll have a good time by myself. sense of celebration and the self-respect that these kids got was phenomenal and I think that's what people respond to in the film and it crosses all lines it's not just the gay community but it's instructive in the best of all possible ways because it talks about um, 
more than anything the power of the human spirit, regardless of, of, of what sexual orientation, say, that you're coming from. It's, it's a really universal uh, uh, celebration. And, and that's what these kids embody, I think, more than anything. Charlie Lang's documentary, Live to Tell, was honored this past summer at LA's Gay and Lesbian Film Festival, Outfest 95. The students at the Eagle Center held their second dance this year and inspired several city school districts across the country to hold their own gay and lesbian proms. Still, I think it's safe to say, Catherine, that same-sex proms will remain the exception rather than the rule for some time. From proms to engagement to marriage, for many young straight couples, that's still the American dream. But what if you're gay? In our society, matrimony is a central social institution. Most people believe that marriage was a basic human right. That is, until gays and lesbians stepped up to the altar. In 1991, three couples, two lesbian, one gay, brought a lawsuit challenging the state of Hawaii's denial of their application for marriage licenses. In May of 1993, the Hawaii Supreme Court ruled that denying marriage licenses to same-sex couples was a violation of the state constitution. Evan Wolfson of Lambda Legal Defense, an organization working to secure civil rights for lesbians and gay men, is one of the lead attorneys on the Hawaii case. The court sent the case back down to the lower court to give the state one chance to come up with a compelling reason why it should be allowed to discriminate. If the state can't do that, it will have to stop. We want our relationship to be recognized the same way that other people's relationships are recognized. We feel that we are married in our own eyes, but we'd like to have that marriage legalized and we'd like to enjoy the same rights that every other married couple has. The Hawaii case has propelled the issue of same-sex marriage into a national topic and its repercussions are being felt not only in the courts. For example, the Reverend Renwick Jackson was recently dismissed as pastor of a Long Island church for officiating at the union of a lesbian couple. I think people have a right to be who they are and to, uh, as long as we're going to bless heterosexual relationships, uh, we shouldn't discriminate against persons of the same gender. Despite the law, many gays and lesbians are taking it upon themselves to perform their own commitment ceremonies. You're showing society that, you know, this woman is the one that I love, the one that I want to spend the rest of my days with, I want to grow old, I want to be sick with her, I want her to take care of me, and, and, and this, is, this was um, just a very formal step for me, and when she asked for me to marry her, I said, sure, yes, most definitely yes. We need to make our relationships much more visible than they are, just overtly in your face. This is who we are, you know, wherever you are, wherever you live, whatever part of your life, we need to have people see us and see us functioning in family units. The backlash from the Hawaii case is already being felt around the nation. In three states already, Alaska, South Dakota, and Utah, anti-marriage propositions have been introduced in the state legislatures. In some states, we're going to see legislatures trying to block recognition of those marriages, to declare that in Utah we will not recognize the marriages that come from other states. And we're going to have to fight that legislation, not only in the court, but first in those legislatures to keep those laws from being adopted. But no matter how it plays out in the courts, lesbians and gay men have the same mix of reasons for wanting to get married as heterosexuals. They want to for personal reasons, for emotional reasons, for economic reasons, for legal reasons. Marriage brings with it a whole range of benefits and protections, legal and economic, that no other institution comes close to bringing. It will be very difficult to, at least at this point, to get you know, to, to get to the point where you can go to a job and say, you know, I have uh, my partner, I want her on my insurance, or I want my partner on, you know, on any situation of my health, unless you actually have some type of legal bond. In the lesbian and gay community, not everyone agrees on whether this issue, the right to marry, should be a priority. We have been framing this dialogue along what white middle class values and we need to take charge and redirect the, the focus of this movement. I very much challenge the notion that marriage is the only family relationship worthy of recognition. Uh, people live in family relationships that are defined in many different ways and I think should have all of the rights and benefits that every other citizen has regardless of that choice. Well I think 
again, we're trying to um, adopt uh, an institution that has taken hold of uh, society. Uh, I think marriage has dictated what tax law should be about, what workplace policies uh, should be about. Marriage has put women as a, in a second-class status. And we need to find new ways or new models for uh, creating families and relationships. Whether gays and lesbians are supportive of the issue or not, the forces that are opposed to gay marriage could make this a crucial issue in the next year. Marriage is a civil right. It is a civil right. And if the right wing is going to stage an entire campaign to deny the gay and lesbian community of the civil right to married, marriage, even I'm going to be at the front of the pack and fighting that. I mean, that's absolutely essential. People understand that, like it or not, whether we would have chosen this battle or not, it is coming. And we need to get out there, get prepared, start doing the public education and political organizing now. Like gays in the military, the Hawaii case has been getting a lot of media attention. But we wanted to wrap up this edition of In the Life with a visit to a segment of our community that rarely makes the headlines. Lesbians and gay men who face addiction or homelessness have few places to go for help where they can be safely out about their sexuality. We found some people here in Los Angeles who believe there's an undeniable connection between accepting your homosexuality and getting sober. Renee Wright Medina celebrated her wedding here at the Sunshine Mission, a women's shelter where she lived for two years. I decided to have my wedding reception here because this is like home for me. This is like where I started my life at. And um, I could never forget that this is what brought me to society in the real world that I can get my life together and I can do what's right. A lesbian wedding isn't really an everyday happening, and I wasn't entirely sure how the board was gonna deal with it, but I figured, well, we'll just tell them <laughs> and let them worry about it. And much to my amazement, as we got closer and I talked more about it with the board, they really embraced the idea, and they thought it was pretty wonderful. When I found out that Fred was gay, I, I was really, really happy. I was like, wow, you know, he's in the family, and he understands, and. He was going to be in my corner about me having my wedding reception here, and if anyone had any doubts about me having it, that he was going to stand up for me. Another unique place we visited was the Alcoholism Center for Women. This program actually makes an effort to reach out to the lesbian community. Lesbians tend to be one of the most unserved or underserved populations when it comes to addiction, and so the services are, are geared uh, to not be oppressive or punitive, and the lesbian can be who she really is. You know, you do feel comfortable here for the fact that I don't like being stared and looked at as, as another, as what is it, you know? And here, coming here, since I'm not the only one that's gay, there's other people gay here, I feel a lot more comfortable. You know, you get respect here. You don't get disrespected. I had a choice to either go to a recovery home, which was the majority were black, and or come to one that was geared to lesbians and women of color. And uh, I chose this one. I felt that I would be more comfortable. I don't think I would complete a program if it wasn't, you know, lesbians involved in it. It's like six months to focus on me, all of me, not anybody else just me for six whole months to learn about me and my disease. So, you know, it was, it was, it was pretty good. There are very, very few, if any, social service agencies that focus on lesbian issues. So we are kind of by default a center for the community in many ways. We have dances here, we have workshops of a variety of kinds. A lot of it is around alcohol recovery, 12-step meetings, things like that. But some of it doesn't have that much to do, but it is preventative because it gives us a place to socialize and connect. The hard part is um, making it through your first 60 days. <laughs> It's, it's really hard to adjust to a schedule. We're up at 6.30 in the morning, which is unheard of, I think, for most of us here, <laughs> because we are all night owls. And, uh, and then, you know, having to eat, to eat breakfast, all everybody together, uh, 
If, even if you fought the night before, you still have to sit there and look at them. You can't walk away, you can't run. You have to face up to whatever it is in your face at all times. Not all the women here are lesbian. There are some heterosexual women here, but they have an understanding when they come in that, that this is you know, a mostly a lesbian center. And they can come in here with homophobia and they heal in the process. And then they're an advocate when they leave here. They, they, are, they support the gay and lesbian community. We're all sisters here, you know, and we've all been through a lot of the same things, you know, yet different. And um, there's a lot of understanding here. A lot of patience, a lot of patience. And finally, we spoke with some people at the Van Ness Recovery House, an addiction program exclusively for the gay, lesbian, and transgendered communities. I grew up not, not knowing I was a lesbian, and um, if I ever knew it, not liking it, and my mechanism for dealing with who I was was drugs and alcohol. And not only was I in the closet as far as being a lesbian, but I was in the closet as a drug addict, drug dealer, alcoholic, and so, after 16 years of drinking and using and nearly dying and six other recovery programs, hospitals, I ended up at the Van Ness House because it became very clear that if I didn't deal with being a lesbian, I'd never stay sober. I don't like being gay, if I could be real honest. I don't like it and I have trouble accepting it. That's why I got married. And I see now looking back that a year after I got married, I started into heroin and cocaine and alcohol very heavily. There are a lot of people here who have struggled with their sexual identity and sexual orientation. And seeing that struggle helps me with my struggle. When I'm out in the world with straight people thinking I'm different, I reinforce that in myself. And this reinforces I'm OK. The flip side of the coin is that because we are gay, lesbian, transgender recovery house, one of the impacts that we've had is that we serve about 90% of our residents at any given time are HIV AIDS. So that means we qualify for Ryan White money. So three quarters of our budget is Ryan White Care Act money, which is wonderful because we'd be in trouble without it. But it also means that not only are we a drug and alcohol recovery house, but we're dealing with HIV and AIDS, which makes it a really huge struggle because to deal with somebody getting sober, many times coming to terms with their sexuality for the first time sober, and then on top of it, HIV and AIDS, you know, it's, it's a big plate full of stuff that we're asking people to deal with. The drama is insane around here um, because you have 21 different gay personalities all, all meshed into one, you know, and everything from people from the street to people who, like me, thought I was grandiose and better than. If this doesn't keep you sober, nothing will. Because when we're seeing, when we're seeing all the 21 different personalities, we may get upset, but we're seeing a lot of ourselves in each and every one of the other people that are here. And taking a good, honest look at yourself is sometimes the hardest thing in the world to do. And this place has an excellent recovery rate. The people that, that come out of here stay clean for a while or stay clean for good, you know, one day at a time, of course, but they stay clean. My friends refer to it, oh, you're going to Camp Hollywood. So that's kind of how I'm looking at my summer uh, and getting well. And finally, we focus on Rue and Jewel, a couple who've made it their mission to make a difference. We begin with Jewel, who 23 years ago opened this club, Catch One, that is by night the largest African-American gay disco in the country and by day serves as a community center. I started the club in 1972. The dream first came to me when I was working across the street at a supermarket as a checker back in the late 60s. And uh, it was known to all the African Americans that they weren't welcome, you know, at the uh, what was then called the Diana Club. So I just kind of said to myself, one of these days I'll own that club and everybody will be welcome. You know, back in the 70s when she started the disco thing um, and I was doing my disco thing, uh, I didn't know Jill personally then. So I, I, I had no idea of the vision 
that she had for our community. Catchment One means a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, for me, it's um, like my being able to contribute to the community. I think um, it's been very instrumental as far as being a place where people could gather to get information about what was going on. This was always a place for us to come and to, to organize. Usually in the African American community, the church is the cornerstone. And the Catch One was kind of like the church to our gay and lesbian community because there was a space here, uh, there was a freedom for us to come and meet and organize. And a lot of the political organizing that came out of, out of our community uh, happened here. In the early days of Unity Fellowship, we had services here. We had our church services here. I stood on the stage with Jesse Jackson when he was running for president. I've been here for AA meetings, for uh, CA meetings. Uh, I have taken meals to the homeless from the kitchen downstairs. So we partied here, but we did good work here as well. For most people, that would be work enough. But in 1989, Rue and Jewel used profits from the Catch One Disco to open Rue's house, a shelter for women and children with AIDS. We basically wanted to do something um, to help the, the children and uh, the mothers uh, in terms of keeping them under one roof. No one was doing that. They were separating them and the children were going to uh, foster care and uh, women were going into adult shelters. And we felt that um, it's just about impossible to keep someone clean and sober, to encourage them uh, to go on living and snatch their child from them. I've had uh, women to come and stay as long as three years. We have women that will come here and clean up and then get back out on the streets and they will use again and they'll come back. They'll call me and ask me if they can come back and when they come back they're just a little bit sicker, just a little worse off and we help them again and I've had them come in and out and as long as they don't give me any real problems when they're here, this is their home, they can always come back here. It makes us feel good because we know that we're doing something right, you know, that we are providing uh, a home for them to want to come back to. Rue and I met at Unity Fellowship. Uh, they invited her to dinner and she never went home after that. <laughs> In our community, People simply don't, um, they generally don't take vows, and when they do, they don't have ceremony. So we don't take ourselves seriously, and if we don't take ourselves seriously with our relationships, we can't expect society to do so. Fortunately, uh, we're not youngsters, and, and so I trust her implicitly to, um, you know, to, to, to be an okay person, and, and I, I believe she trusts me too. That's definite. Um, you know, you get to a certain age, you only have enough energy to do so much. <laughs> and we <laughs> and ours is generally spent in the community trying to make a difference. Motivation and commitment to change have brought lesbians from around the world to China, young people to a prom where they felt accepted for the first time, and incredible individuals to the hearts of their communities to help those in need. It has also brought these determined people by bike from Boston here to Manhattan to raise millions of dollars towards the fight against AIDS. These efforts and the results are symbols of how far lesbians and gays have come, how determined they remain, and how many miles there are to go. I'm Katherine Linton. From all of us at In The Life, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.
In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Ameringen Foundation. Additional support provided by Fred P. Hochberg and Tom Healy, James C. Hormel, Jonathan B. Sheffer, Jeffrey B. Soroff, Eldon W. Tamblin, and In the Life's National Membership Network.